Although I told myself I was looking merely for a shooting presence, a glorified pot of feu, pot of feu, an animated merking, what really attracted me to Valeria was the imitation she gave of a little girl. She gave it not because she had divined something about me, it was just her style, and I fell for it. Actually, she was at least in her late twenties. I never established her exact age for even her passport light, and had mislaid her virginity under circumstances that changed with her reminiscent moods. I, on my part, was as naive as only a pervert can be. She looked fluffy, fluffy, and frolicsome, dressed a la gamin, showed a generous amount of smooth leg, knew how to stress the white of a bear in step by the black of a velvet slipper, and pouted and dimpled and romped and dirndled and shook her short curly blonde hair in the cutest and tritest fashion imaginable. After a brief ceremony at the mairie, I took her to the new apartment I had rented and, somewhat to her surprise, had her wear before I touched her a girl's plain nightshirt that I had managed to filch from the linen closet of an orphanage. I derived some fun from that nuptial night and had the idiot in hysterics by sunrise. But reality soon asserted itself. The bleached curl revealed its melanic root. The down turned to prickles on a shaved shin. The mobile moist mouth, no matter how I stuffed it with love, disclosed ignominiously its resemblance to the corresponding part in a treasured portrait of her toad-like dead mum. And presently, instead of a pale little gutter girl, Humbert Humbert had on his hands a large, puffy, short-legged, big-breasted and practically brainless baba. This state of affairs lasted from 1935 to 1939. Her only asset was a muted nature which did help to produce an odd sense of comfort in our small squalid flat. Two rooms, a hazy view in one window, a brick wall in the other, a tiny kitchen, a shoe-shaped bathtub within which I felt like Marat but with no white-necked maiden to stab me. And we had quite a few cozy evenings together, she deep in her Parisois. I working at a rickety table. We went to movies, bicycle races and boxing matches. I appealed to her stale flesh very seldom, only in cases of great urgency and despair. The grocer opposite had a little daughter whose shadow drove me mad. But with Valeria's help I did find, after all some legal outlets to my fantastic predicament. As to cooking, we tacitly dismissed the pot au fait and had most of our meals at a crowded place in Rue Bonaparte, where there were wine stains on the table, clothes, and a good deal of foreign bubble. And next door, an art dealer displayed in his cluttered window a splendid flamboyant, green, red, golden, and inky blue ancient American stamp, a locomotive with a gigantic smokestack, great baroque lamps, and a tremendous co-catcher, holding its mauve coaches through the stormy prairie night and mixing a lot of sparks studded black smoke with the furry thunder clouds. This burst. In the summer of 1939, mon oncle d'Amérique died bequeathing me an annual income of a few thousand dollars on condition I came to live in the States and showed some interest in his business. This prospect was most welcome to me. <coughs> Sorry. I felt my life needed a shake-up. There was another thing, too. Most holes had appeared in the plush of matrimonial comfort. During the last weeks, I had kept noticing that my fat Valeria was not her usual self, had acquired a queer restlessness, even showed something like irritation at times, which was quite our 
quite out of keeping with the stock charter she was supposed to impersonate. When I informed her we were shortly to sail for New York, she looked distressed and bewildered. There were some tedious difficulties with her papers. Uh, she had a nonsense, or better say nonsense, passport, which for some reason I share in her husband's solid Swiss citizenship, citizenship could not easily transcend. And I decided it was the necessity of queuing in the prefecture and other formalities that had made her so listless, despite my patiently describing to her America, the country of rosy children and great trees, where life would be such an improvement on dull, dingy Paris. We were coming out of some office building one morning, with her papers almost in order, when Valeria, as she well waddled by my side, began to shake her poodle head vigorously without saying a word. I let her go on for a while and then asked if she thought she had something inside. She answered, I translate from her French, which was, I imagine, a translation in its turn of some Slavic platitude. There is another man in my life. Now, these are ugly words for a husband to hear. They dazed me, I confess. To beat her up in the street, there and then, as an honest Bulgarian might have done, was not feasible. Years of secret sufferings had taught me superhuman self-control, so I ushered her into a taxi, which had been invitingly creeping along the curb for some time, and in this comparative privacy I quietly suggested she comment her wild talk. A mountain fairy was suffocating me, not because I had any particular fondness for that figure of fun, Madame Humbert, but because matters of legal and illegal conjunction were for me alone to decide, and here she was, Valeria, the comedy wife, brazenly preparing to dispose in her own way of my comfort and fate. I demanded her lover's name. I repeated my question, but she kept up a burlesque bubble, discoursing on her unhappiness with me, and announcing plans for an immediate divorce. Mais qui est -ce? I shouted at last, striking her on the knee with my fist. And she, without even wincing, stared at me as if the answer were too simple for words, then gave a quick shrug and pointed at the thick neck of the taxi driver. He pulled up at a small café and introduced himself. I do not remember his ridiculous name, but after all those years I still see him quite clearly. Stocky, white Russian ex-colonel with a bushy moustache and a crew cut. There were thousands of them plying that full trade in Paris. We sat down at a table. The Tsarist ordered wine. And Valeria, after applying a wet napkin to her knee, went on talking, into me rather than to me. She poured words into this dignified receptacle with a volubility I had never suspected she had in her. And every now and then she would volley, volley a burst of Slavic at her stolid lover. The situation was preposterous and became even more so when the taxi colonel, stopping Valeria with a possessive smile, began to unfold his views and plans. With an atrocious accent to his careful French, he delineated the world of love and work into which he proposed to enter hand in hand with his child wife, Valeria. She, by now, was preening himself, herself between him and me, rouging her pursed lips, tripling her chin to peek at her blues bosom, and so forth and he spoke of her as if she were absent, and also as if she were a kind of a little word that was in the act of being transferred, for her own good, from one wise guardian to another even wiser one. And although my helpless wrath may have exaggerated and disfigured certain impressions, I can swear that he actually consulted me on such things as her diet, her periods, her wardrobe, and the books she had read, or she should read. I think, she said, I think, he said, she will like Jean Christophe. Oh, he was quite a scholar, Mr. Taksovich. 
I put an end to this gibberish by suggesting Valeria pack up her few belongings immediately, upon which the platitudinous colonel gallantly offered to carry them into the car. Reverting to his professional estate, he drove the Humberts to their residence, and all the way Valeria talked, and Humbert the Terrible deliberated with Humbert the Small whether Humbert Humbert should kill her or her lover, or both, or neither. I remember once handling an automatic belonging to a fellow student. In the days, I have not spoken of them, I think, but never mind, when I toyed with the idea of enjoying his little sister. A most diaph diaphanous nymphet with a black hair bow and then shooting myself. I now wondered if Valiechka, as the colonel called her, was really worth shooting or strangling or drowning. She had very vulnerable legs and I decided I would limit myself to hurting her very horribly as soon as we were alone. But we never were. Valiechka by now shedding torrents of tears tinged with the mess of her rainbow makeup, started to feel anyhow a trunk, and two suitcases, and a bursting cartoon, and visions of putting on my mountain boots, and taking a running kick at her ramp, were of course impossible to put into execution with the cursed colonel hovering around all the time. I cannot say he behaved insolently or anything like that, on the contrary, he displayed as a small sideshow in the theatricals I had been inveigling a discreet old-world civility, punctuating his movements with all sorts of mispronounced apologies. Je demande pardonner, excuse me, et ce que je puis, may I, and so forth. And turning away tactfully when Valieshka took down with a flourish her pink panties from the clothesline above the tube. But he seemed to be all over the place at once, le grandin, agreeing his frame with the anatomy of the flat, reading in my chair my newspaper, and tying a knot string, rolling a cigarette, counting the teaspoons, visiting the bathroom, helping his small to wrap up the electric fan her father ha had given her, and carrying streetward her luggage. I sat with arms folded, one hip on the window sill, dying of hate and boredom. At last, both were out of the quivering apartment, the vibration of the door I had slammed after them still rang in my every nerve, a poor substitute for the backhand slap with which I ought to have hit her across the cheekbone according to the rules of the movies. Glamsily playing my part, I stomped to the bathroom to check if they had taken my English toilet water, they had not. But I noticed with a span, spasm of fierce disgust that the former counselor of the Tsar, after thoroughly easing his bladder, had not flushed the toilet. That solemn pool of alien urine with a soggy, tawny cigarette butt disintegrating in it struck disintegrating in it, struck me as a crowning insult, and I wildly looked around for a weapon. Actually, I dare say, it was nothing but middle-class Russian courtesy, with an oriental tongue perhaps, that had prompted the good colonel, Maximovich, his name suddenly taxes back to me, a very formal person as they all are, to muffle his private need in decorous silence, so as not to underscore the small size of his host's domicile with uh, the rush of a gross cascade on top of its own harsh trickle. But this did not enter in my mind at the moment, as groaning with rage I ransacked the kitchen for something better than a broom. Then, cancelling my search, I dashed out of the house with the heroic decision of attacking him barefisted. Despite my natural vigor, I am no pugilist, while the short but broad-shouldered Maximovich seemed made of big iron. The void of the street, revealing nothing of my wife's departure except a rhinestone button she had dropped in the mud after preserving it for three unnecessary years in a broken box, may have spared me with a bloody nose. But no matter, I had my little revenge in due time. A man from Pasadena told me one day that Mrs. Maximovich, near Zarabovsky, 
had died in childbirth, in childbirth around 1945. The couple had somehow got over to California and had been used there for an excellent salary in a year-long experiment conducted by a distinguished American ethnologist. The experiment dealt with human and racial reactions to a diet of bananas and dates in a constant position on all fours. My informant, a doctor, swore he had seen with his own eyes obese Valieczka and her colonel by then grey-haired and also quite corpulent diligently crawling about the well-swept floors of a brightly lit set of rooms fruiting one, watering another, mats in a third, and so on, in the company of several other hard quadrupeds selected from indigent and helpless groups. I tried to find the results of these tests in the review of anthropology, but they appear not to have been published yet. These scientific projects take, of course, some time to fluctuate. I hope they will be illustrated with good photographs when they, get to, uh, when they do get printed, although it is not very likely that a prison library uh, will harbor such erudite works. The one to which I am restricted these days, despite my lawyer's favors, is a good example of the inane eclecticism governing the selection of books in, price in prison libraries. They have the Bible, of course, and Dickens, an ancient set, New York, uh, G.W. Dilligan, publisher, and the Children's Encyclopedia, with some nice photographs of sunshine-haired Girl Scouts in shorts. And a murder is announced by Agatha Christie, but they also have such coruscating trifles as A Vagabond in Italy by Percy Elphinstone, author of Venice Revisited, Boston, 1868, and a comparatively, comparatively, comparatively recent, 1946, Who's Who in the Limelight, actors, producers, playwrights, and shots of static scenes. In looking through the latter volume, I was treated last night to one of those dazzling coincidences that logicians loathe and poets love. I transcribe most of the page. Pim Roland, born in Lundy, Mass, 1922, received stage training at Elsinore Playhouse Derby, New York. Made debut in Sunburst. Among his many appearances are Two Blocks from Here, The Girl in Green, Scrambled Husbands, The Strange Mushroom, Touch and Go, Young Lovely, I Was Dreaming of You. Quilty Claire, American dramatist, born in Ocean City, New Jersey, 1911, educated at Columbia University, started on a commercial career but turned to playwriting. Author of The Little Nymph, The Lady Who Loved Lightning, in collaboration with Vivian Darkbloom, Dark Age, The Strange Mushroom, Fatherly Love, and others. His many plays for children are notable. Little Nymph, 1940, traveled 14,000 miles and played 280 performances on the road during the winter before ending the New York before ending in New York. Hobbies: fast cars, photography, pets. Quine Dolores, born in 1882 in Dayton, Ohio, studied for stage at American Academy. First played in Ottawa in 1900. Made New York debut in 1904 in Never Talk to Strangers, has disappeared since, in a list of some 30 plays that follows. How the look of my dear love's name even affixed to some old hag of an actress still makes me rock with helpless pain. Perhaps she might have been an actress too, born 1935. Appeared, I noticed the slip of my pen in the preceding paragraph, but please do not correctly, Clarence, in The Murdered Playwright. Quine the swine, guilty of killing Quilty. Oh, my Lolita, I have only words to play with. <laughs>